I'm sure we've all been walking outside somewhere when we've come across something that seemed very out of place. Upon closer inspection, we either find that the object is not what it appeared to be, or it is innocent enough, we forget about it and walk on. When a teenage boy came across three suitcases under a bridge along the Lehigh River, never in a million years did he think he would be the one to discover a female body alongside a fetus. Trigger warning, there will be talk of dismemberment and of a deceased baby in this episode as we uncover the unsolved murder of Beth Doe. Hello and welcome to the 16th episode of Uncover True Crime Podcast. My name is Stephanie and each week we uncover a different unsolved true crime case ranging from missing persons, unsolved murders, Jane and John Doe's and suspicious deaths. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other podcast streaming apps as well as on YouTube by searching Uncover True Crime. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Uncover underscore pod and on Instagram at Uncover True Crime Pod. Before we get started on today's case I just want to let you all know that we have a new website I know the blog I had before which had all the pictures and sources related to each case was not great and as I've said before I'm very new to this whole podcast website thing so thank you so much for your patience but this is a proper website and it looks so much better than our blog before so please check it out. The website is www.uncovertruecrimepodcast.co.uk Without any further ado, let's uncover the unsolved murder of Beth Doe. On the 20th of December 1976, a teenage boy found three suitcases which had likely been thrown from the bridge above from Interstate 80 in Eastside Borough, Pennsylvania. One of the cases had opened upon impact and the boy found the dismembered body of a female. Police were called and they examined the rest of the cases. They would find the rest of her body, with exception of her breasts, nose and ears, which to this day have never been found. She had been pregnant prior to her death and her fetus, a full-term baby girl, was found alongside her inside the cases. She was later nicknamed Beth Doe and that's how I'll be referring to her going forward. Beth and the baby had been wrapped in a pink bed sheet which had a yellow embroidered pattern on it. Also in one of the suitcases was a new New York Daily News newspaper from the 26th of September that same year. The handles of the suitcases had been cut off and all the suitcases were the exact same size, 23 inches long, 14 inches wide and 7.5 inches deep. Two of the suitcases were blue, one was tan plaid and the zippers had been sprayed or painted black. Beth had died a horrendous death. She had been raped strangled and shot in the neck. The ability of whoever dismembered her body was described as being quote, not to a surgeon type cut, but he knew what he was doing, unquote. Has he done this before? Or did he just have a very specific skill set learned through his job or maybe a hobby? This next part is particularly disturbing, so please fast forward a minute or two if you don't want to hear it, but her baby, a full-term female, was not in Beth's womb when discovered, so it's possible that the killer either used his skills to remove her child from the womb or she went into labour during the attack. Either way, it's absolutely awful and her last moments would have been absolutely petrifying. Police in Carbon County were baffled, with Trooper Ryan Knoll of Pennsylvania State Police saying, quote, This would be an unusual case for any area based on the ghastly nature of the murder. The area where she was found was very rural and quiet and there have not been any cases that are believed to be related in the area. Unquote. She was buried in a potter's field in Laurie Town, Lehigh Township in 1983, but not before police did everything in their power to find out as much about her as possible so they could discover her true identity. She had died between one day to one week before she was found, but the writing on her hand suggested it had been less than 24 hours since she was killed, as most of it was still legible. On her right hand, someone had written the letters WSR followed by either a 4 or a 5 and then either a 4 or a 7. This combination didn't match any license plates and please do not know what, if any, significance this has. She was between 15 to 25 years old, stood between 4 foot 11 to 5 foot 4 and weighed 150 pounds. 
Although, as she was nine months pregnant, I reckon she was probably slightly lighter than this naturally. Her face was recognisable, although the post-mortem photos have never been released by police, as her nose and ears had been removed. There is a photo on social media claiming to be Beth Doe's post-mortem picture. I will not be including it in the YouTube video or in the blog, as it's too disturbing and we don't even know if it's legitimate. Given that it was found on a social media site, I personally doubt it's often if it truly is a picture of Beth Doe, the first digital composite released of her is very accurate and it's likely that composite was an edited version of the post-mortem photo or vice versa. Anyway, moving on. She had brown wavy hair and brown eyes. She had a two inch scar on her left calf and a five and a half inch scar on her left leg just above her heel. Although I do want to note that the scar above her heel was not mentioned on her name as profile or on the poster created by the National Centre for Missing Exploited Children. She had a mole on her right cheek and above her right eyebrow that might have developed during her pregnancy. She had significant tooth decay, had undergone three extractions, several restorations and had extreme decay. This would have likely caused her a lot of pain that she might have sought medical attention for and it likely would have been noticeable to those around her. Her oral hygiene had improved slightly on the run-up to her death but was still poor as her lateral incisors were fractured. I would be interested to know if they found any evidence she was taking prenatal supplements such as folid acid etc. This would help us know if she had access to medical care, free or otherwise. While she had clearly received dental care given the amount of extractions and restorations she had had, it probably wasn't frequent, as if she had regularly attended a dentist, her teeth might not be in such bad disrepair. If she couldn't afford to go to a dentist, could she afford medical care? Knowing whether or not she had access to these facilities might help us understand her lifestyle. Was she transient or maybe struggling to make ends meet? Any information we can glean from seemingly small pieces of information like this could be the key to someone recognising her description and identifying her. One thing police are certain of is that she wasn't native to the area. Isotope testing indicated that she had not spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania and had likely spent much of her younger years in the southeastern states, possibly Texas, Virginia or their neighbouring states. It's also possible she had immigrated from East Central Europe and that she'd been in America for at least 5 to 10 years prior to her death. Police exhumed her body in October 2007 to try to find out more information about her, but they were unsuccessful. What everyone thought was a huge break in her case happened in 2019 when police believed Beth Doe might actually be Madeline Maggie Cruz whose foster sister had contacted police after seeing Beth's composite photo and noticed a striking similarity. In 1976, Maggie had called a friend saying she was pregnant and in need of money and that was the last time anyone heard from her. However, after seeing the appeal for information, Maggie herself contacted police and confirmed she was very much alive. Twelve other women have been ruled out as being Beth Doe. I'm going to list some now in order from the date they were last seen. Anna Frances Leatherwood, last seen on the 20th of May 1966 in Seaverville, Tennessee. Denise Shahey, last seen on the 7th of July 1970 in Queens, New York. Rory Jean Kessinger, last seen on the 27th of May 1973 from Plymouth, Massachusetts. Patricia Jane Seba, last seen on the 26th of October 1973 from Grove City, Pennsylvania. Valerie Lorraine Kuka, last seen on the 4th of May 1974 in Brooklyn, New York. Anna Banitskis, last seen on the 27th of August 1974 in Victoria, Australia. Teresa Lynn Fitton, last seen on the 1st of August 1975 in Fort Lauderdale, California. Iris Leslie Brown, last seen on the 15th of March 1976 in Burlington, Vermont. Sherry Elizabeth Roach, last seen on the 8th of June 1976 in San Mateo, California. Mary C. Robinson, last seen on the 10th of June 1976 in Rochester, New York. Trini Lynn Gibson, last seen on the 8th of October 1976 in the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. And finally, Georgia Darlene Nolan, last seen on the 25th of November 1976 in Harlan, Kentucky. All of these women are still missing. 
Beth Doe now remains nameless almost 44 years after her discovery. The DNA Doe project have made amazing progress in the field of genetic genealogy and while they are not currently working on her case, I hope that one day they do or she is identified some other way. As I said in another Jane Doe case involving an unborn child, perhaps the DNA from the child might help in identifying the father. Again, in this case, I don't know if police were able to do this. Beth and her child both deserve justice and to be reunited with their family, and I really hope this happens sooner rather than later. If you have any information on Beth Doe, please contact the Carbon County Coroner's Office on 570-669-9898 or you can contact Pennsylvania State Police on 570-459-3890. All photos and sources related to this case and every other case we've covered on this podcast can be found at www uncoveredtruecrimepodcast.co.uk That's everything I have for you today. Thank you for listening till the very end. Please stay safe and have a good night.